Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Sandcasting for the 21st Century, with your presenter, Alex Rulo, Production Manager for Fusium. And my name is Maria Ma, the Marketing Campaign Coordinator for Engineering.com, and I'll be your moderator today. First, a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's webinar will be recorded, then available for on-demand replay on Engineering.com. For attending this full live session, you'll receive a PDH certificate within 48 hours. If you have any questions, please submit directly in this webinar interface, and we'll try to address all questions during Q&A. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to our presenter. Alex, over to you. All right. So, hi, welcome to today's webinar. Let me introduce myself. My name is Alex Trudeau. Uh, let's start with a quick background about me. After completing my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, I was hired by Sagne Foundry in early 2010. I started here doing quality management for a year and moved on to sales from 2011 to 2018 while still keeping an eye out on production. I did my MBA and also did my Lean Six Sigma Green Belt certification at that time. Fusion is actually two foundries, both specializing in short production runs of sand castings. One does very large iron castings up to 16,000 pounds and the other one is doing magnesium and aluminium castings. So here's a quick overlook of what we will go through today. A journey that starts as soon as you design a casting and that will end with the completion of said casting. At each step, there are do's and don'ts that will ensure you get the right part at the right time and the right price. And believe me, as someone who has been on both sides of the ball here during my tenure in sales and in production, some of these tips can make a huge difference to your bottom line and to your production cycle. So this webinar is called the sand casting process for the 21st century. First, let's go back a bit. Casting metals is a brand new technology from 7,000 years ago. Way back, tools, weapons, and religious objects were casted with a few different casting methods. But the basic idea has not really changed at all. You pour metal and sign some kind of cavity, wait for it to cool down, and you get a nice, complex part that would be costly or even impossible to do in a different way. Through the years, the technologies have improved to melt more efficiently, to mold with better accuracy, and to clean the parts quicker and more effectively. But in the recent few years, the technological developments with computers, with automation, or with the Internet of Things brought an accelerating trend to manufacture dif differently. Their effects tend to be especially relevant in all services that are peripherals to the actual casting process, like the part design or the mold design stages. Although, although it has had an impact, big or small, on every aspect of the process. Before we jump in, however, I think it's important to know some of the basic lingo of the casting process. So we'll quickly go through a few of these words, so we're all on the same page about the meaning of draft angles, parting lines, and cores. I will also describe the components of a simple gating system and talk briefly about shrinkage before I jump back to the process itself. Let's start by talking about draft angles. This concept is not unique to castings. Other manufacturing processes like plastic injection molding also need draft angles. On this image, the iron section is the pattern. We'll discuss patterns later, but for now, simply know that for sand castings, we do a pattern from wood or metal or some other material that will have roughly the shape of our final part. We then fill our mold with sand, pictured in dark blue. For some sand casting process, we need to ram the pattern hard in the mold to make the cavity. Further, we use what is called the no-bake process. We have a sand that is mixed with a resin and, after a few minutes, it becomes very hard. We can then pull the pattern out of the mold. So, a draft angle is a small angle on vertical surfaces in the mold. If the pattern is properly drafted, like on the top row, the pattern will easily come out of the mold, leaving a smooth cavity in the sand. On the other hand, if the surface is vertical, or even worse, if it has what we call a backdraft, like it's shown on the bottom row, the mold will break. The pattern will probably break too. A fundamental concept in the casting process is the parting line. Let's say you want to fabricate a tube. If we simply put a tube and pack it with sand, the draft angles will not be okay in any places. So when we try to take out the pattern out of the sand, the mold and the pattern will break. So what we do is we add a parting line. In essence, we, don't do, we won't do one mold, but two molds that will have each have one half of the part. We'll then secure these two halves on top of each other before pouring. 
In the case of my hollow tube, it works wonder for the outside of my tube, but not so much for the inside. We're getting there though. So this is where cores come into play. Instead of trying to mold two halves of an hollow tube, we'll mold two halves of a bar with the correct outside dimension and fill the inside on the pattern. And completely apart, we'll do a third piece of sand that will have the shape of the hole in our tube. We'll then assemble the three parts of our mold. Just quick aside in foundries that a part of the mold is always called the cope. The bottom part is called the drag. All right, so we mentioned the mold and the cores. But at the end of the day, we need metal in our part, not just cavities in a sandbox. We need the metal to go from our furnace into our mold to fill the cavities. There are some typical words for that. So let's say you want to produce the, that nice yellow box in metal as shown in my very ga simple gating system. You will mold it into the sand, but you need a path to get the metal to that box. It starts with a pouring basin. The pouring basin is a larger component shown here in blue that is especially useful for certain type of pouring process. For instance, at Saguenay Foundry, we pour metal with a tilting ladle, a process common with iron foundries. The larger pouring ba basin makes it easier for operators to aim and avoid spillage. The metal will then go down the sprue, shown in dark red, and then fill the green runner. Once the runner is full, the metal will reach the end gates and then the the casting. We'll get back later to why this is set up this way. Now that we've talked about most of the components of a mold, let's talk briefly about shrinkage because I often hear misconceptions about the term. We'll come back a few times in my presentation. First, shrinkage in the foundry world is the unavoidable fact that when we pour metal, it will contract or shrink when it cools. Different alloys will shrink differently but it will always happen to a certain degree. Now, this creates two issues that any foundryman will have to deal with directly. First, the cavity in the mold must always be bigger than the actual part we want to pour. If you go on the floor of a ductile iron foundry to look for the mold of your four foot long part and measure it with your trusty measuring tape, you will see a dimension of four foot and a half inch. Your measuring tape is not broken and the foundry does care about the dimensions of your final part. Come back to measure your actual part when that's cooled down, and it will be the right dimensions because it will have contracted by half an inch. The only issue with shrinkage was the dimensions of the mold, however, being a foundryman would be very easy and probably even a little boring. But that contraction doesn't only mean that the part will get smaller. If we do nothing, it will tend to have holes in the middle too. These holes are called shrinkage porosity. We'll get to them later, but for now, note that shrinkage is the contraction of the metal and that it can lead to porosity. Now, let's get back to our process. In this section, we'll discuss the design of a part, the quoting and ordering process, and the engineering a foundry will do to fabricate a quality part. I will include a short foundry engineering crash course at that point. So, designing a part. So your process, or product that will need a part that you will design. The first big do, think about your process right away. You might still have to get back to this choice. You might want to explore more than one choice, but having the awareness of your final fabrication process can make a huge impact. I've quoted so many parts in the past that were designed as wellments and that should not have been designed as wellments. There's definitely a cost to redesign at later stages, although that cost is almost always lower than the cost of using the wrong process for your part. So the question you might ask yourself now is, what is the right process? And as a foundry guy, I will tell you, always go for castings. Nothing is better than castings. The more serious note though, weldments tend to be a good fit for low volume parts where mass and mass distribution is not a big issue. Forging offers great quality, but is a better fit for higher volume production of smaller and simpler parts because it, it has a relatively high startup cost and it is limited in the size and complexity it can handle. Die casting is an ideal way to produce very high production volumes of certain alloys, usually non-ferrous metals like aluminium, zinc, copper, or magnesium. Sand casting offers good quality, complex part, and can be competitive for both very low production volumes, even one-offs, or for large production volumes. <clears throat> 
Once you have picked a process, you need to educate yourself about the specific requirements of this process. For sand castings, as we mentioned earlier, draft angles will be required and will add material to your part. You must be aware that a very uneven thickness will bring the price of your part up. We'll get to that later. You must be aware of what kind of accuracy you can expect from this process. Now you have a design that is ready to move to a quote. And the first thing you will have to consider is how many parts. The tooling will not be the same for a foundry prototype or for 1 million parts a year. So to get the right pricing here, you must have a conversation with your foundry and sometimes with different foundries. If you come to me with a request for 100,000 parts a year, I will refer, refer you elsewhere. I'm simply not set up for that. If you need one part, 50 parts a year or 500 parts a year, however, then we can have interesting conversations. The same can be said of lead time. If time is of the essence for production, we might be able to offer quicker but costlier alternatives. Send printing, for instance, has been quicker but more expensive in many cases for customers. But if your value is in lead time, it's something we understand and will gladly work with you. The quoting process is also a good moment to have a conversation about specs. There are the basic one like materials that are a must. Often, Specs will be made to an international standards like, let's say, ASTM A536 for ductile iron. Sometimes, you will have your own specs with further requirements. You might want some specific testing done, like an X-ray or something like that. This can all impact cost. In my career, what I've seen affect the cost and the lead time the most, however, is a bad communication of expectations. One of the best examples I have is concerning dimensional tolerances. First, if you are designing a part, there's a spec that I will suggest very strongly. It's called ISO 8062-3. It's a great spec that was built by very smart people and that describes what type of tolerances that can be expected depending on the casting process, the material that is poured, the size of the parts, and the quantities to produce. Miscommunications about acceptable tolerances can easily lead to scrap parts, rework, basically a lot of wasted cost and lead time. In closing about the quoting process, especially when developing a new source, learn to know each other. Cost or lead time, what matters most to you? Do we need to speak to a specific person in your organization for specific questions? Should we expect strong ramp off? Seasonal orders? Is the design you are showing us frozen, or should we expect a lot of iterations? All of this info will lead to a more targeted approach to your order and a better cost and lead time for a project. So you got a quote. You're happy with pricing lead time and now you're ready to order. There are a few basic things that are really helpful to have directly along with the order. It may sound quite obvious, but since I've seen it missing so many times, I will mention it here. Drawing revisions directly on the order. In a good foundry, that's an order review process while accepting a new order. And having the drawing revision right on the peel, you will have a key point to avoid useless back and forth and make sure that the foundry and the customer are on the same page. Other information that are really useful, a bit of material if the drawing needs complementary information, your quality specs, if they are different from standards, the ordered quantities, and the date you need them to ship from a foundry. When we start the production of new custom-made casting, the first thing we need is some kind of tooling. With the sand casting process, there are two families of patterns, permanent and temporary. Permanent patterns are patterns that will be used again and again to do cavities in a sand mold. Metal patterns are the most expensive, but also the most durable. They're especially relevant when you have an over 10,000 parts a year to fabricate, so the cost of the initial pattern will not be too overwhelming in the total cost of production. A jobbing foundry like Fusion that will do short to medium production rounds will instead use wood patterns most of the time for any kind of recurring orders. For parts that are not too complicated, a well-fabricated wood pattern can do 1,000 parts a year without, with only minor repairs along the way. It will do parts repeatedly without important variability for many years. However, a wood pattern might not be accurate enough in some rare cases, not stable enough for specific type of productions. With TMA, for instance, or magnesium foundry, we often fabricate parts that are six feet long, but only one sixteenth of an inch thick. The smallest variation with lead, uh, will lead to scrap production. Resin patterns really shine for those productions where pattern stability is critical. A part of our business is dedicated to prototypes of very low usage parts. A wood pattern can easily cost over $10,000 for $2,000 casting. 
If you do, if you do a thousand parts with this pattern, your two thousand dollar casting costs two thousand dollar and ten. That's not a big deal. If you'd only one casting, however, your two thousand dollar casting costs twelve thousand dollar with a wood pattern. But sometimes you don't need the same level of accuracy because your process does not require it, or because you will machine off surfaces anyway. Sometimes you just need more affordable alternatives. Foam patterns are a great fit when you need no more than a handful of castings, especially if they are not too intricate. Your $2,000 casting might cost you an extra two or $3,000. That's not free, but that's much better than $12,000 from our earlier example. And then there's sand printing. Sand printing is an amazing technology for complex casting, especially to fabricate the cores for parts with intricate cavities. By printing successive layers of sand, you can do parts that are not possible or very expensive to do with traditional patterns, but also have our first computed core in our hands long before a core box can be made. It tends, however, to be very pricey for bigger parts. A part that is 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches has a 1,000 cubic inch print box. It can be printed quite quickly and is affordable. If every dimension is double, 20 inches by 20 inches by 20 inches, the volume gets eight times higher, and so does the cost and the time to print. But 8,000 cubic inches is still not too big an issue. Here, we sometimes have cores that are over 100,000 cubic inches. That takes a while, and that costs a lot. It's important to recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach will not lead to better cost or better lead time. Each process has its ups and shortfalls, and a process review is important to pick the right process for the right casting. And you might be wondering now, why go through the casting process at all? Why not print directly your parts and avoid having to build a pattern altogether? In some cases, the answer is, there's absolutely no reason to stick to casting. Printing is a better fit. But then, there are all the other cases. First, let's talk briefly about materials. There are plenty of materials that simply cannot be printed yet and probably won't be available anytime soon either. No irons can be printed. A limited variety of trade of aluminium can be printed. Magnesium is not quite there yet. So, can the right material for your project be printed? Or will you have to settle for something inferior? And even if you can use the same material, will the mechanical properties be as good to what you would get from a casted part? It's not always the case, so you may want to do some testing to find out. Then there are size limitations. As of now, the build envelopes of the larger machines on the market are still not that big when printing metals. Six cubic feet of envelope is a very big, very expensive machine. For us, it's a very small casting. The machines are slowly getting bigger, but they cannot compare to the largest castings yet, not even close. And there might be many cases that even when you can get a part made in a material that is good enough and in a size that fits in your machine, the speed of the machine might well not be good enough. As far as printing speed goes, 600 cubic inches an hour is a lot. Yet, we have a smallish jobbing foundry and we pour well over 10,000 cubic inches an hour. So I will need 20 machines working lights out to match my capacity if I get no downtime and no setup times from my printers. I can pour $16,000 pounds casting in 20 minutes and I can redo that same casting the day after and the day after that. So even if machines big enough would exist with current speed, I would need more than four days of printing time, so I would need four machines just for that one part to be produced at the same rate as I can do with a pattern. So once again, printing metal is an amazing technology that can produce amazing results in very specific circumstances, but it has to come a very long way before truly competing with castings, if ever. Moving on to one of my favorite foundry quotes, the quickest and cheapest way to do a single casting is to do it a single time. That's by me, and you can quote me on that. So, to do parts a single time, we have to carefully design our mold instead of re recklessly testing our mold. We'll also need to be able to fabricate this pattern eventually. We start off by modeling the part. Often, customers send us a 2D print, so we have to start from scratch. Other times, we already have a 3D of their final part. For us, that's often the best state to receive drawings. Modeling an old blueprint can be time consuming. On the other hand, we have seen issues and confusion when customers add their own machining stocks, draft angles, and so on. You are the specialist in the final part you need, but we are the specialist to cast it.
drafting goals may get confusing because castings often not only have a parting line for the two halves of the mold, but also a parting line on most cores. These cores' parting lines may be in the same direction as the mold's parting line, but may also be in completely different directions. In the picture, you can see the yellow box in the lower right corner. That's actually the representation of a core. The pattern for this part was split on the bottom of that core, but because of its shape, the core box had to be split along a different surface from the part's main parting line. As I mentioned earlier, a pattern will always be bigger than the actual part that is produced due to the contraction of the metal during cooling. And it's noticeable enough that it must be taken into account during mold design. For irons, it will generally be around 2%. Aluminium and magnesium shrink more, about twice that amount. And other materials like certain grade of steels can shrink even more. Sharp angles are a big issue in castings. Not only can it make a part sharp and therefore more dangerous to handle, there's a specific type of porosity that is directly linked to sharp corners, but always add fillets to prevent this defect. I mentioned previously the spec ISOID 062-3 for dimensional tolerances. It also has a great table for the amount of machining stock required depending on material and casting size. We tend to want to reduce as much as possible the machining of stock to reduce machining time later, but going too thin here can easily mean clean up issues, rework at later stages, or even scrap after a lot of money has been invested in your part. If you want to reduce risk, this machining stock table is a great tool. So as I mentioned, foundrymen foundry are the experts on transforming a final part into a manufacturable part. When you do business with a foundry, just send a treaty of a final part along with any other required information and we'll do the rest. Once this is done, we start designing our core boxes, our gating and riser ring system, and everything that needs to be done to produce quality parts. Fluent cell assimilations are a key component for our low volume production where we cannot afford the cost and the delay caused by scrap parts. Many of the most common foundry defects can be prevented with a good simulation process, especially the issues regarding pouring, gating design, and riser ring design. Here, every time we do a new pattern, we run simulation to make sure that we can answer many questions before we start production. Are we pouring at the right temperature? Will the metal run through all the casting? Do we risk internal shrinkage defect or gas-related porosity? In the good old days, basic rule of thumb existed to get these answers. But they had huge safety factors, and the only way to refine the design was to try something, scrap a gas thing, cut it, and then try something else. When the problem was straightforward, with a simple casting that only needed a bigger riser, that was not a big issue. But when you get to complex castings with unusual geometries, the interactions between all the elements in the mold could get overwhelming fast. With simulations, it becomes easy to visualize the impact of a change, and although it still has to be used cautiously, it accelerates tremendously the pace and the level of refinement of our designs. It will also reduce the cost of fabrication by avoiding scrap and reducing safety factors that would otherwise be built in. I would now direct your attention toward the, the image on the screen. Earlier, as I was discussing during the design and stage, an uneven thickness will lead to an increased cost. That might have seemed a bit abstract then, so there's a quick Foundry 101 class. The image shows what is called a geometric models, a concept based on research from a Czech engineer that I will not name today because I don't want to butcher his name. So I wrote it below the image if you're interested to learn more about him and about this concept. But essentially, if you have a certain volume of molten metal, you will have a certain amount of heat. And if you have a certain surface surrounding that molten metal, that surface will allow heat to dissipate at a certain rate. So if you divide the volume by the surface area, you also divide the amount of heat by its capacity to dissipate. It's called the modulus. This modulus is extremely interesting because if everything else is equal, the higher the modulus, the longer it will take for the molten metal to become solid in that area. The less areas to cool will have porosity in it. It's also very interesting because it's extremely simple. No complex thermodynamics, no fluid mechanics, only geometry. So once again, on our image, a darker orange means an higher modulus. So you will see, for instance, that the modulus is higher at the intersections between the flanges and the body of the part. It means that this will cool less and that if we do nothing, 
will have porosity inside our part there. And that might not be an issue if there isn't too much stress on this part. But then again, it might be a big issue. How can we solve it? The most common way is to add risers. Risers are simply a cavity in the mold that, will, that we will let fill with metal. It will be designed to solidify after our part. To do so, we'll make sure it has a larger modulus than our part. There are two ways to get that. Either we'll make it big, so it has a very high geometric modulus, or we'll do it with a supporting material that will make it cool slower or even generate an exothermal reaction. The difference can be seen on the screen. Even a simple part will have porosity if you simply let it shrink. In the case of the part shown here, there's a thicker flange that will have some porosity as shown on the left. However, with the right risers, the right place, you can have all the shrinkage porosity located in areas that will be removed from the casting. The casting itself will be porosity free, as you can see on the right of your screen. With this being said, a riser means more molten metal, more work to mold it, and more work to clean the part. In other words, added cost. And if you throw into the mix a part with a very uneven thickness, as I mentioned previously, you might need a lot of risers, and that may increase cost a fair bit. Shrinkage porosity is one of the better known defects in foundry. It can happen more often than most other defects. It has more chances to mean a scrap part than almost any other defect. That's a very annoying bit to be seen most of the times only during the machining stage once you have already put in a lot of value in a part because it will often have no external manifestation. But it's not the only possible defect in castings and it's not the only defect that can be prevented by solid simulation process. A gating system that goes too slowly will risk that the metal will solidify too fast and the casting might be incomplete. A gating system that goes too, uh, too fast will be harder for the operators to keep the pouring basin full. In an iron foundry, it will mean more slag in the part and will also lead to porosity. A more complex issue is turbulence in a mold that can cause many quality problems like film oxide or sand entrapment that would all cause porosity or weak spots in our part. The challenge is that it is almost impossible to maintain a laminar flow all through the process because molten metal have a high density, bringing the Reynolds number high even at low speed. Also, for manufacturability reasons, they will generally fall from a certain height, picking up speed quickly. The goal then becomes not to eliminate turbulence completely, but to make sure it doesn't happen where it would be very detrimental to our final part, in the part itself or in the gate, the end gates. As you can see in the two pictures above, the velocity is important while the metal is falling in the down sprue. However, the way the runner and the end gates are designed, the speed will go down drastically and revert back to a laminar flow quickly, reducing the risk of defects in the part. There are the risks linked to the pouring process that are, in large parts, managed by simulation. Then there's everything else. So simulations are not enough. They assume a perfect world with little variability. They're about the pouring and cooling process only. They do not instruct us on how to fabricate our molds and set up the cores. They do not paint a clear picture of every step that will have to be done leading to the pouring and all the steps that will be taken after the cooling phase. That's why we have part-specific work instructions. This is probably the most critical process to maintain quality in a jobbing foundry. Maintaining process stability with tons of metals or tons of sand is one thing, and I don't want to minimize the challenges linked to maintaining any kind of manufacturing process consistent. But there are very specific challenges when you do a part once every five years. There are very specific challenges when you do 500 different parts in any given year. How do you maintain consistency when production changes every day? The value of a jobbing foundry resides in large parts in its ability to manage that knowledge. If I was a casting buyer of such parts, the most important question I would ask any jobbing foundry before they can become suppliers is how do you manage that information? If someone retiring can put a system at risk, you have a problem. If a filling cabinet catching fire can put a system at risk, you have a problem. That information in itself is worth almost as much, as much as the physical pattern. Often, a supplier will not want to share the specific information. That's where there are trade secrets. But if they cannot share how they manage it, that's a red flag. 
And now that we have done all of this and spent all of this time via the computer screen, we know how the part will be done and we can finally start manufacturing. In the next section, we'll talk about pattern fabrication, then core making and molding. We'll also go through pouring, cleaning, and the value added services that are typical with castings, like painting or machining. As you now know, in any sand casting process, you will need a cavity in the sand mold to fabricate your parts. In most cases, you will need a pattern, as we previously discussed. This is one of the most important drivers of lead time. A small, simple pattern can take only a few hours to fabricate. But some of the larger patterns we do here take several hundreds of hours to complete. In many ways, it's a craft more than a process, requiring the knowledge of both a foundryman and a master carpenter. It includes more traditional craftsmanship like woodworking, but also modern CNC machining. You need to know what are the right essence of wood or resin for each project and how they will be used by the core makers and the molders at the end of the line. You need to adjust constantly to new geometries, new parts, and new challenges, as you almost always start from nothing. If you look at a picture on the screen, however, I think it gives a pretty strong case to why we still go through pattern fabrication. What you see there is the underside of an ingot mold. Steel cannot be used for these parts because it would be quickly destroyed by the material that will be poured in the ingot. But even if that wasn't the case, imagine the complexity to do such part in weldments. Or imagine the cost to develop dies to forge this part. You might also notice that the pattern is set on a board. In the jobbing foundry, we will often not use these boards to keep costs low. But when we do use these boards, it allows us to keep fabrication more repeatable. The gating system, for instance, will be mounted directly on the board, so we will ensure it will stay exactly the same from one order to another, whereas loose patterns can vary a bit more from one production to the other. Here, we'll generally use pine and mahogany to do our wood patterns. Pine is soft wood that is very easy to work with and not too expensive. We'll use it on most features in a pattern. Sometimes, we know that some portion of our patterns will have more stress. Mahogany, which is more expensive but also more durable, will handle itself well in these cases. So it would be very appropriate to use in some areas. So in short, patterns takes a while to fabricate and can be expensive. That's why it's critical to make the right decisions to choose the right type of patterns right from the start. Once the pattern is done, we bring what, what we call core boxes to the core makers. That's the moment we know we are getting close to see casting in our hands. As you might have deduced from the rest of our presentation, without cores, the part that could be done in foundry would be rather limited. But coring allows tr a tremendous flexibility for geometries, allowing internal cavities that would be otherwise impossible with a different process. Once again, if we look at the core in the picture, you might recognize the shape from one of my earlier slides. The core on the left that looks not that complicated allows us to do the one piece cavity that goes around the center area of the part as well as the three arms of the casting shown in section view. That would be simply impossible to forge or machine, but easy, or maybe I should say almost easy to do with castings. As you can see on the second picture, an extra core, the blue arrow, will go in the middle to make the center hub. So with these two pieces of sand that we will lower into the mold, we can now fabricate a part that is complex, made of one piece of metal that has exactly the right shape to perform the way it must perform. However, cores will drive the cost and lead time up for casting. It's one more process during the molding process. It also adds extra work when you do the final cleanup of a casting. So a good design stance is to try to find a good balance between simplicity to reduce fabrication costs and complexity to increase performance and therefore reduce your total cost of ownership. Generally here, we'll do the cores the day before the molds. So when the cores are completed, we can mo move on to, the fab to fabricating the mold. This is one of the most crucial steps in the quality of the casting. There are more opportunities for mistakes and defects at that step than anywhere else in the process. If you look at the picture, it was a drag in the foreground and scope in the background. As we said previously, the drag, the one in the foreground, will be the bottom half of our mold. So we'll let it rest on the ground like this and then paint it with a few coats of refractory paint to protect the sand from the metal and the metal from the sand. In general, if cores are required, they will be set in this drag. Once everything is in place, 
we can flip the code, the one on the background, uh, on top of it. We'll then either clamp, bolt, or sometimes even weld the two halves together so the mold stays shut during pouring and cooling. With this being said, there's not that much labor cost associated with molding, relatively speaking. With the type of jobbing foundries we have, not even a quarter of the labor force will go toward molding. For the same reason, other constraints might be a bigger driver of lead time. Floor space, machine capacities, or melting capacity might all lead to capacity constraints. At Sagnin Foundry, we used flask to manipulate the mold, flask being the steel frame you can see around the black sand on the picture. We have a certain quantity of flasks, a certain size or capacity for a higher volume part might be driven more by these flasks than anything else. Now that you have a nice completed sand mold, you need to get some metal inside. As I mentioned at Fusium, we have two foundries that need to proceed in slightly different ways. In both cases, a strength control over point temperature is required. A low temperature risks misrun and incomplete castings. But if the point temperature gets too high, increase the risk of internal shrinkage. So the right middle ground has to be found. We use thermocouples to be able to measure the temperature and pour within a very narrow plus minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or plus minus 5 degrees Celsius window to ensure we replicate as closely as possible the parameters of our simulation. In our iron foundry, we melt scrap metals, so we need to adjust the chemistry every time with various alloys to get the right properties. Indeed, preparing iron is a bit like baking. Instead of flour and sugar, though, we need scrap steel and pig iron. And instead of vanilla extract, we'll add a dash of carbon and manganese and a variety of other alloys that might increase certain specific properties like hardness or heat resistance. Our magnesium and aluminum foundry, however, melts standard ingots that already have the right chemistry. In both cases, we need to manage slag which are little pockets of different metals that the one we want to pour, and that will cause defect in the final casting. But we manage it in completely different way, ways as it floats in iron and sinks in magnesium. And when we pour aluminium or magnesium, we need to ensure to, to control the amount of gas in the melt. So we have different process there to degas our metal. Once it's been poured, it needs to cool. It's not an issue for magnesium and aluminium castings, cooling times are pretty quick. But for large iron or steel castings with larger risers, cooling time can be as long as one week. And unfortunately, it cannot really be forced without running the risk of causing harm to the casting. A part that has cooled too quickly will have internal stress that might hinder its performance. It will tend to have very hard and brittle surfaces too. So if you purchase very large iron castings, be aware that your lead time might be driven upward by the cooling time. After cooling is done, we have a nice, almost done casting in a sand mold. So first thing first, we need to shake out the mold. Sand molds tend to be resistant to compression, but not so much resistant to shear stress. So we use this to our advantage by literally shaking the mold very hard so it breaks apart. We then retrieve the very rough casting. Then. There's all the gating system and the risering system that needs to be taken off by different means. Also, during the molding process, there's always some little gaps in the mold. The parting line or between a core and score print, for example. We also need to grind this off to a part that is safe to handle for employees, our suppliers, and our customers. Among the services we may add to our castings, the first step that might need to be taken is heat treating. Heat treatment can be done to modify mechanical properties. In aluminium and magnesium, for instance, every part will be treated because the S-cast material doesn't add their interesting properties. In iron, no heat treatment is required except for a very specific grade of irons. A good example is ductile iron 60, 40, 18, a ductile iron class with 18% elongation. To reach such ductility, an annealing is often required. For other parts in iron, Heat treatment is generally not required. However, in some cases, there might be some internal stress in the casting, which can be especially significant for certain geometries. An half circle, for instance, would have a strong tendency to have internal stresses. If, afterward, you need to machine down your part and all very tight tolerances, this internal stress might prevent you from reaching these tolerances. 
So stress relief can be helpful in these cases. In any cases, heat treating can take one to four days depending on the type of treatment or the thickness of your part, among other factors. It might also induce a bottleneck in production. So we'll add some extra cost and lead time linked to heat treating. There are a few surfaces, uh, surface treatment that can be applied on castings. For iron castings, most of the time we do nothing. Rust and irons tend to be superficial and therefore doesn't hinder most applications. If rust is an issue, however, we can apply some primer and paint to protect the surface. With aluminium and magnesium, we'll often do a powder coat, which is extremely durable in a rough environment. In both cases, there's an added advantage in a better looking part, especially useful the casting will end up visible in your product. After painting, it can be interesting to send the parts to machine so they can have the finishing touches made. Castings are easy to machine with materials that are quite consistent throughout a part. So we get very tight tolerances and very polished surfaces from machine castings. However, it's important to understand the type of accuracy that is required for a project. And once again, ISO 8062-3 is a great source of information for what you can or cannot get directly from a casting. It will be very informative to know where you might need to machine and which surfaces you may leave as cast. Because the casting process is what we call a near net shape process. So what does it mean when I say that casting is a near net shape process? What that means is that you can get complex shape directly from the process, but you cannot expect very tight tolerances as would be required, let's say for a fit assembly. The best example would be the fabrication of a ventry like the huge 10,000 pounds one shown on the screen. You might need relatively complex free-flowing shapes with smooth transitions to ensure good flow of fluid inside the venturi. This would be extremely complex and expensive to do from a stock bar or with weldments. But the required accuracy is probably not one thousandth of an inch for a 36 inch diameter venturi. However, you might need a bold pattern to be precise on both ends to assemble your venturi with the rest of your assembly. You probably need that surface to be very flat, much flatter than what the casting process can offer. So to get these mating surfaces to the right tolerances, you will machine them down. And that's one of the big advantages of castings. You might have to machine only five or 10% of your part instead of machining close to 100% of a stock bar, saving on cost and on wasted material. Quality checks. In most cases, the two main questions you will ask yourself is, is my casting the right shape and will it be strong enough? In a lot of cases, a dimensional review of the part and a tensile test with a sample of the same metal the part was poured with will be enough. Chemistry and metallography are two tests that are extremely useful for process control. It can also provide very useful information to some customers, especially in cases where the mechanical properties are not the main issue. At Sagni Foundry, we see this happening mostly when we do castings that need high heat resistance. With that being said, most of our customers don't need this information. And then there are certain parts or markets that will need extra specific tests. At TMA, we provide a lot of prototype castings for the automotive industry. These castings tend to be very intricate with very thin walls. So even if your sample material is incredible, if you have porosity in your very thin wall, the part will fail. Because of this, X-rays are often required. Sometimes we'll do a trust sound if X-rays are not feasible or affordable. For certain castings, like the castings going into a windmill, for instance, impact resistance at low temperature are important. That's not the type of test we'll do often because it's expensive and do not add value to most of the castings we do, but that will be very useful on occasions. And once the quality review is completed, the casting is done and ready to ship to our customers, which completes the process. I want to stress, however, that quality is so much more than the verifications at the end of the process. As we have seen throughout the presentation, quality is something that is built from the design stage of a part, not something that will happen just with testing afterward. In today's world, where being green is more and more looked into, I think it's very important to mention the crucial role foundries play in the, in the industrial ecosystem. First, I want to mention that both of our foundries are run by electric furnaces, in an area where almost all electricity is generated by hydroelectric dams. It makes for very low carbon emissions for production. Sagni Foundry 
used to have a couple of furnaces, which burns coal. Obviously, that emitted a fair amount of green gas, greenhouse gas. In the mid-80s, these furnaces were replaced by induction furnaces, which are more cleaner to operate and also offers a more reliable quality, especially when produce, producing ductile iron. We have also made the choice to reclaim our sand mechanically, which reduces drastically the amount of waste generated by our daily operations. But beyond using the right process to reduce our footprint as much as possible, it is important to stress that foundries are fundamentally recycling plants. The picture on the bottom left is what we actually melt to produce our parts, scrap steel that is not of any use anymore. We also use a byproduct of titanium production in our melt, and we melt some scrapped iron too. So basically, over 95% of what we melt each time is recy recycled metal from another process. And with that, we can do brand new parts like the one on the picture that is an actual part of a windmill that I've shown previously in my presentation. And then, at some point in the future, that part of the windmill will be replaced for a new one. No problem, we'll be able to melt it again and give it brand new properties and brand new functionality. So as I mentioned, Foundries plays a critical role in the metal recycling industry, giving a new life to seemingly unusable material. So as you can see, the sand casting process is a complex and fascinating process. But if you follow the few tips described during this webinar, you will get the right part at the right time and the right cost. But if I had to underscore three of these tips, it would be, first, choose the right process that fits your need. Then, educate yourself like you've been doing today, but the specific challenges, limitation, and opportunities of that process. And third, communicate with your supplier. Communicate expectations or adjustments that need to be made. Communication is the key here. Which completes today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope it has been both instructive and worth your time. If you would like more information, please visit our webpage or LinkedIn account. And do not hesitate to reach us if you have any further question, questions. And now, Let's listen to questions from attendees. Thanks so much, Alex, for that very detailed presentation. That was awesome. Here's our first question. Can you repeat the ISO standard number for tolerance in casting? Yeah, sure. It's ISO 8062-3. Awesome. Thank you. Next question. Any experience with sand casting of cast 711.0-T1 alloys as suitable material for brazing or soldering later in the process. They're looking for the supplier for sand casting uh, that alloy for some time now. No, unfortunately, that's not one of the alloys we, uh, we do. We go for more common aluminum alloys and iron, uh, depending on which plants you're talking about, but not this one in specifically. Okay, understood. Thank you. Uh, what tool is currently used for flow and solid simulation, like molds and parts, of your process? Yeah, we uh, we decided to go for a European tool that's called Novacast. Awesome. Thank you. Is cooling done at freestanding, like ambient temperature, or does the cooling process require a specific cooling system? It would depend on different foundries operation, but we uh, we just let it stand on place. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned in our presentation, we avoid forcing the cooling of the casting. It's really related to the type of castings we do, but we would have issues with the quality if we did so. So it's really just freestanding, being in the sand, it slows rather quickly. So it controls the, the drop of temperature that way, uh, but it can take a while as I mentioned earlier. Great, thank you. And this is more of a general question. Um, can you, a high level, describe fusium? Sure. A fusium is, uh, is actually two different foundries, as I mentioned early on. So uh, we, uh, the owners, uh, we used to have uh, a foundry, uh, iron foundry, large castings, uh, which uh, was founded in 1980. Uh, three years ago, we had the opportunity to buy uh, a already existing foundry uh, doing both aluminium and magnesium castings. A uh, smaller operation, uh, but very interesting castings on very interesting markets. So when we did buy uh, 
this second foundry, we decided to create that Alding Fusion uh, that's Alding and operating these two foundries. Perfect, thank you. In the case of the Venturi shown earlier, the internal uh, surface finish is a key. Uh, how is this checked and validated on the quality control side? Of course. Uh, of course, uh, with Venturi's that size, uh, the uh, the surface can say kind of rough. Uh, so what we, we need is to keep a 500 RMS figure on this, uh, th these surfaces. Uh, so basically it's kind of the typical surface that we get from iron castings. Uh, so there are basically matching plates that we can compare different surface finish to make sure that we are in the right areas. Uh, since it doesn't need to be more precise than that, these little plates that can compare the, the surface finish are enough. If that was not the case, there are tools that can be used, uh, but it was not required for, for that specific part for that specific customer. Awesome, thank you. What material is used in your windmill hub, just out of curiosity? Yeah, it's a, it's a specific grade of ductile iron. Uh, there are uh, specs uh, mainly coming from Germany uh, in that regard, but it's uh, ductile iron that needs to be resistant at low temperature. Uh, so we need to do very specific uh, impact testing on the samples to make sure it can uh, withstand a certain amount of strength at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Thank you. Uh, would a foundry getting involved in the product design stage with the customer bring any value? Yes, it's something we see more and more. Uh, a few years back, it was not really uh, often that we would see customers coming to us. Uh, but with the, the advance of 3D modeling and everything, engineers tend to go further and further to what's possible and what not. Um, obviously, beyond a screen, everything's possible. In real life, that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, so the the better companies at designing have come to us early in the process to make sure uh, they know what can and cannot be done in casting. That has improved their their development cycle quite a, by quite a, f a fair amount at that point, reducing both cost and rework uh, at later stages because their parts was easier to manufacture while still keeping the uh, performance they required for their process. Awesome, thank you. So this attendee understands that the, the tooling is not the same for producing several thousand parts compared to a few hundred, but does the manufacturing process in different stages stay the same? It will depend to some degrees. Uh, you might have uh, noticed the mold that we uh, that I showed earlier in my slide, uh, which was set on the floor. So it's a very original name. We call that floor molding. Uh, this is generally more for jobbing foundries and low volume foundries. Uh, with very high production runs, uh, we're talking about tens of thousands a year or hundred thousand a, a, a year. We tend to have more machine molding with machines that can produce hundreds of moles an hour, uh, which is generally for smaller castings too. Uh, but apart from that, the main idea stays the same. It's still a pattern that will look the same, that would be used by a machine instead of uh, maybe more by, uh, by people. Uh, so more automation, but still the basic having a wood or a metal pattern doing a cavity in a sand mold and then pouring inside. Great, thank you. Do all foundries offer value added services like heat treatment, machining and painting to name a few? I would not say all, but I would say most. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, something that uh, that is all done internally. Uh, depending on TMA, we do our own machining, our own heat treating. Uh, Sagne Foundry, we do only heat treating in-house and we'll supply the machining. Most companies will have closed suppliers for that. Some companies won't. Uh, so it kind of depends on the, the business model of any foundry. 
but in general, you will be able to to get these uh, value added services from uh, from the foundry directly. Awesome, thank you. What is your typical sand binder? Uh, we uh, we use what is called furent. Great, thanks. Is it acceptable to ask the foundry they're dealing with to visit their installation prior to giving them a project or even during the production stage of their order? Yeah, it's something that's a bit more difficult since about a year because of COVID-19. But apart from that, it's something that we uh, we love to uh, to do, actually. Uh, I think it's something that can be both uh, a, a really good thing for both sides. And I would say if you can afford that, if you can do that, what's even better is to both visit the foundry yourself and to have your customer, your foundry visit you. So you both understand each other's process. Uh, because sometimes something that might be might seems obvious might not be uh, but most foundries i know and definitely us we will uh, let customers see us uh, many of our more established customers actually have audits that they need to perform on their customers too so they're welcome to to do that too awesome thank you is deburring common or necessary after sand casting Yes, uh, with, there's uh, there's always some fins that will appear. Uh, there are those little gaps in the mold and cannot be perfectly tight uh, for basic reasons. But let's say you want to fit a core inside the mold. If you don't have uh, any loose uh, areas there, any loose fits, well, it just will not come in, uh, come on. So it's normal to have some gaps in the mold and all the gaps in the mold will be filled with metal and then you will have to clean that at the end. Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Thanks again, Alex, and thank you attendees for joining us. We hope to see you again for our future webinars. Bye for now.